I am very fortunate to be a board member of the organization, and uh, it's a very special time to be involved with this. We've got our group of the 14th intake here who are making their last hurdle in America before they head off to Australia after a couple weeks off. We'll probably see some of them in Saratoga, I'm sure. Um, but first of all, we obviously uh, got to talk about this program. You start with Sheikh Mohammed, the support he has provided for this ever since its inception. Um, the great commitment he's made uh, over the years and, and the difference you're already seeing in the industry as a result of this. There's been other constants along with Sheikh Mohammed. We've got Clota Kavanaugh and Joe Osborne, who really led the organization um, from the management perspective. Martin Larkin's here representing the organization from Ireland. He's kind of back office, making sure everything goes well from central headquarters. And, and obviously, Tammy, we've already mentioned, but I think Tammy deserves a round of applause from everybody. Thank you. Thank is here now, and those who have been through America know that Tammy makes a big difference in the program, and we're very lucky to have you. Thank you. Um, so kind of a parting message is kind of a little graduation speech for a minute as you leave America. Um, as I said, Sheikh Mohammed has been the, the spirit behind this, and it's, it's not charity. You know, this is obviously an investment that's being made in y'all for the future of this industry, for yourselves, individual benefit, but really for the greater good of this industry that we all love, um, that we've all made our livelihood. And I was thinking about this, you know, really the future will be determined by the talent level of the people who decide to get in this business. And I think it's really a testimony to the program that you see the talent level is gonna help push us, just like any global industry, you're only gonna go as far as the human talent there to push us forward. And I encourage y'all to, to not be bashful about that to really take it, um, take the investment, um, be worthy of the investment. I think we've seen the TDNs had a couple great articles with one of the graduates in Australia, the last few uh, editions talking about the new frontier, um, the changing dynamics of the world and how that relates to thoroughbred racing specifically. So don't be bashful, push forward, um, make us be better, help us see things that are not obvious to those of us that have been in it for longer periods of time, and, and I think the future will be very bright. Um, along with Sheikh Mohammed, obviously a lot of people in here have committed themselves to this program, and this, the program would not be what it is without the industry support and those of you who make your time available for internships, for tours, lectures, uh, obviously job placement after it's over. That's critically important for this program to maximize its potential. So thanks to each of y'all who have done that. Um, I know we had Kate Galvin, who, uh, by the way, was awarded the uh, Award of Excellence by her peers, the alumni. Ms. Kate is well We are very fortunate to have Kate on our team at uh, the Darley Stallions. Tammy, am I leaving anything off? No, you got it. I got it. All right, Kate, it's up to you, and, and she's going to explain how this is going to work. You know, we mix it up every year, the final project, so we have a little different twist. And so Kate is going to lead us through the mechanics of what we're doing now. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Kate Galvin, and I'm a Godolphin Flying Start graduate of 2006. Um, so it is my pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you to Godolphin Flying Start, Tammy, for all your organizing, and of course, Caitlin, for the beautiful venue. Um, the trainees have worked really hard on their presentation tonight, and I'm sure you're going to love it. They're a really impressive group, and it's a motivating presentation at that. So, um, to build on from Dan's introduction, as he mentioned, the trainees have been here for the last six months in Kentucky. Um, this is phase three of the course for them. So, after this, they're going to head on to Australia, then Dubai, and again back to Ireland in the spring of 2018. Um, they spent the last six weeks of the American leg on placement, and with many of you in this room, we just want to say a special thank you. Um, Airdrie Stud, Nakoma Bloodstock, Solis and Lit Bloodstock, Keeneland, TDN, Equine Analysis Group, um, and then trainers like Tom Morley, Brendan Walsh, Mike Stidham, Phil Diamato, Ralph Nix, Christoph Clement. <laughs> I think that's everybody. <laughs> so the, the placements are so important. 
they really get a taste for the real world and can apply some of the classroom knowledge they're getting at Flying Start, and it also um, you know, helps them make their decisions for the next 18 months, which direction they kind of want to go in, so thank you very much. Um, now on to tonight's program. This assignment is part of the trainees' communications module, so they're going to be graded on the content of the material, on their understanding of it, on their ability to communicate it to you, and of course, um, how innovative they are. Um, they were asked as a group to take a strategic approach to the U.S. thoroughbred industry and develop a 10-year vision. I'm pretty sure, as many of you can imagine, working with 12 people from different backgrounds, many different countries, to reach one common goal or idea for how the thoroughbred world can improve themselves was probably the biggest thing they could probably take away from this, and that's what many of you in this room, I'm sure, have seen as a challenge to, to why we you know, are at this point. Um, as you'll notice in your handouts, um, in the booklets in front of you, that in developing their vision, they were asked to use um, a strategy execution system, which they learned through the Harvard Business School. Um, it's called Building a Balanced Scorecard. And it's used as a tool to translate business strategy into actionable goals. Um, so the big take home message there is in addition to having the trainees think about the future of the American thoroughbred industry, we also are hopefully grooming them to think like world leaders. The balanced scorecard is a method that they estimate over 35% of companies worldwide use when looking at their long-term goals and where they want to go. Um, so at the end of the presentation, we're going to have a little question and answer session. We definitely want to get everybody's feedback and engage with the trainees. Um, so without any more from me, I'm going to hand it off to Ami Carlson and Jessica Berry, who are going to get it started. Thank you, Kate. So I'm Ami Carlson from Sweden. This is Jessica Berry from uh, Kentucky. And as Kate has already mentioned, our topic for this year's Flying Star Conference is to build a 10 years vision for American racing. Because we want to see American racing increase in popularity again. I mean, there was a time when racing was the most popular spectator sport in America. But although the Kentucky Derby still is one of the premier sporting events in the country, the interest in horse racing in general has faded. In the 1950s, racing was still in the top three together with baseball and boxing. But despite horses like Secretariat, Affirmed, Seattle Slough and John Henry, the interest in racing did fade during the second half of the 20th century. Still, as late as in 1985, 4% of the Americans regarded horse racing as their favorite sport, making it the eighth most popular sport in America. When that question is asked today, only 1% of Americans prefer horse racing over other sports. And that means that horse racing has dropped to number 13 on that list. So, yes again, what should we do about this? Thank you, Ami, for a look back at where we've been as an industry and a description of where we are today. And both of those things are important for us to understand before we can decide where it is that we would like to go. Our vision for the future of U.S. racing is that by 2027, we will be a top 10 sport in America. The purpose of this conference is to devise a strategy on how to get us there. As a guide, as Kate has already mentioned, uh, we have created a strategy map using four interdependent perspectives. The first is learning and growth, which will focus on recruitment, education, and data collection. Then there's internal business, which will examine marketing, regulation, and welfare. Then we have the customer perspective, which looks at the race day experience, promotionals, and the media. And finally, we'll have a presentation from the financial perspective, which analyzes simulcasting contracts, wagering offers, and foreign investment. So to start us off, I'd like to hand things over to Madison Scott with our learning and growth perspective. Thank you, Jesse. I'm Madison Scott, and here with Laura and Joe, we covered the learning and growth section for this conference. Learning and growth covers the human, organizational, and information capital needed to implement a long-term strategy 
and work towards a sustainable and hopefully successful goal. I covered organizational capital, and as we're all well aware, there's many organizations that make up the American racing industry. Some unique challenges we face due to a lack of governing body and the sheer size and scope of our racing industry have led to many industries and organizations that have popped up to help serve the business that we're in. Bodies like the Jockey Club, TOBA, Breeders' Cup, NTRA, Naira, and countless others serve to promote, protect the integrity of, and serve those within our horse racing industry. However, sometimes these bodies fall short. Racing has a PR problem, which I think we're all aware of. Horsemen run the industry, which, of course, horses are the reason we're all here. But horsemen are often not the best people suited to promote and drive an entire industry like racing. We're all aware of the high profile breakdowns or animal welfare concerns that can press our sport. In a quick trip over to Google, you can see what the public thinks about racing. A search, you can quickly see that some of the most popular topics searched for are how many breakdowns are there, how many racehorses go to slaughter, how many die each year. And quite frankly, not great. On Facebook, you see much of the same thing. This is a Facebook page run by industry bodies and organizations that exist to support horse racing reform and promote unity for our industry. However, scrolling through the comments, you see tons of negativity. Horse racing is the same as animal abuse. Owners and breeders are cruel. Horse racing is the same as drug testing. How could a greedy industry survive? Again, this is on an industry page that should exist to promote and showcase horse racing. Perhaps just as concerning as the number of inflammatory comments on this page are racing's lack of response. There's been no management of these comments. There are no replies to help educate these people or manage what they're saying, and posts are still up. They haven't been taken down. Um, that's, that's not great. We don't want the world to see this about our sport when they go to learn more about racing integrity. This page has 50,000 likes, which on the surface seems amazing. But once you actually dig and realize these people are liking the page for the purpose of sharing with their Facebook friends uh, negative posts about racing and meeting other people who think racing is animal abuse, you realize that's not as great as it sounds. We conducted many interviews as part of this conference as our research, and one of the things that came out repeatedly in our group was apathy. People felt that some at top organizations were apathetic about the industry. They had no desire to innovate or promote racing or develop fans, and quite frankly, that should be all of our concern. Another issue that came out through interviews was tunnel vision, and that's something I fall victim to myself. Of course, my Facebook page doesn't look like that. It's filled with positive things about racing and pictures and results and news, but that's not what the wider public sees when they look at our sport. This tunnel vision leads to inward thinking and only looking at ourselves internally and forgetting that the rest of the world doesn't feel the same way about racing. Quite frankly, the public does not care and does not understand horse racing, but that is our problem, not theirs. To lead organizational change and cultural change is a massive undertaking that cannot be taken lightly and will need need a massive investment. Laura is going to speak next about human capital and ways that we can invest in this to help better promote our industry. She's a little short, so. I actually like to think it's a very tall podium. <laughs> and I've been told I'm not the first person to use this. So with that, I will talk about human capital. So human capital is the skills, knowledge, and experience that create your workforce. The thoroughbred industry is unique in the workforce that we do create. We have generations of families that return to our sport. I don't know very many other industries that can say the same thing. Others find their way through a love of the horse, the sport, or both. Our industry is our greatest asset. There's nobody who's going to look out for our interests more than us. There are plenty of educational channels available for people to create horsemen. You only have to look at the new generation coming through in the sale room and trainers to see that we create great horsemen within our industry. MPAs have seen a recent rise in enrollment globally. An MBA teaches strategy, management, and organizational skills. So I'm not saying that we need to take every horseman and enroll them in an MBA, 
but we do need to foster these skills within our industry to drive our industry forward. Another really important, sorry, I looked at other sporting industries to see where they were going right with their human capital and what they were doing to drive their sport forward for fans. The NBA really stood out for me. Their company policy, their company policy to play with passion, lead with integrity and inspire play really struck a chord with me because we compete so intensely with each other. We compete on the track, we compete in the salary. We know that our industry doesn't have a huge integrity problem like we saw on Madison's. We know that amongst ourselves, integrity is at the forefront of our minds when we consider how we interact with each other, the type of business deals that we do, and what we value in our sport. But what we don't do is inspire play. The NBA actively recruit for international growth, communications, digital development, and software engineers. I don't know a huge amount of organisations that place the same emphasis within the horse racing industry on these talents. Another really important positive aspect of recruitment is diversity. I surveyed 20 leading industry bodies and their, board of, their boards of directors. For every 10 seats on a board, 1.4 are occupied by females. An even smaller amount can be considered to be occupied by non-Caucasians and a majority belong to the same age bracket. Diversity is so crucial for driving a vision and a goal. Diversity isn't just your ethnicity, sex, age, but also your skills, knowledge and experience. Recently, last year actually, Google launched the Google Lunar X Prize Challenge. The challenge is relatively simple. Land a robot on the moon and have it walk 200 metres. So it's maybe not the most straightforward, but when you put $30 million on the line, 16 different teams managed to find a way that they thought it was simple enough to give it a go. We have plenty of incentives in our industry. We offer scholarships and financial reward for people who are already studying in our industry. But maybe it's time that we take some of those initiatives and we broaden the field, we open it up to software engineers, to marketing majors, and to communication majors, and say, what can you create for horse racing? Human capital is really, really difficult to measure success with. There are several methods that we can, we already have, retention. Our, license go, our licensing bodies can measure how many license holders are renewing each year. We can take consumer metrics. But I think our best method is that we address how much return on investment we're getting when, it, when we come to engagement of fans and what we're listening to from our fans. And with that, I'm going to quite literally hop off my soapbox and hand you over to Joe, who's going to talk a little bit about gathering that kind of data. Thank you very much, Laura. Information capital. So what is information capital and how important is it? Today, some of the world's leading organisations invest far more into information than they do into actual assets. If you think about it, Airbnb, Facebook, Uber, Google. How do they make, make their business? They make their business by gathering data, harvesting that data, tracking what we do, what we need, and targeting as we want. So what is big data? Big data is exactly what they do. They use systems such as Google Analytics. Google Analytics provide a free memory service where we can track what people want, what people use, and once again target them. How can we put this into our industry? Social media is a prime example. Madison spoke about that page of 50,000 people. That's a lot of people and a lot of tracking. We can see what other things these people like, their interests, their hobbies, and we can target these events to try to bring these people towards racing. We have good information already through the likes of TDN and Bloodhorse. People are signing up for these pages. We know our love, the fans who love the sport, the diehard fans. What about the people with a small interest? 
we need to spur their targets a little bit more. To show how common social media is, an example is Amy Carlson, one of our fellow colleagues, tweeted something a few weeks ago in relation to this conference. She asked for people to take part in the interview. That tweet reached 40,000 people in relation to gathering data. That shows how broad this is and how we can use this to our advantage to get opinions from people, to see what we can do, to bring people here. Social media can be our friend. We can use it to our advantage and it really is important in today's world and it's only getting more important. In relation to tourism, people come to Keeneland, Churchill, Saratoga. They Snapchat, they Facebook, they like it, they check in, we know they're there. Why not set up a shared system between us, between the racetracks, between the likes of horse country? Tell people tourists are in town. Use these people, get their information, have them log into some sort of a service. We can know these people are in Lexington, these people are in New York, these people are in Florida. We can use this to our advantage to target them and bring them into our tracks and get them to fall in love with our sports. The people who come racing a little bit more often, supply them with some sort of a loyalty card, an app to scan when they walk in. So we know where they're going, we know their trends, we know their behaviour, we know if they're going up to make a bet. We can track what these people are doing so we can target them more sell what we have to give, sell this industry to these people. A simple way of tracking these, which many people are putting into place, is a service called AmpThink. Why not when people walk in and sign into your Wi-Fi? Give them a survey. Have you ever walked into an airport and just signed into your Wi-Fi? Or a restaurant? You have to give your details, your email, your demographics. A simple service such as this. We know if they're in town as a tourist, we know if they're there in business, we know exactly what the person here is doing and we can sell them the industry and try to bring them in closer. People who have done this very lately are the likes of Sacramento Kings, the NBA team. They set up an amp think, and they could tell that 71% of people who attended their games only attended one game. They can tell only 6% of people attended every game. 11% of people were students. This is by something simple as this. They know the demographics, they know where they're strong, they know they're weak. So they can target the areas they need to improve and keep other consumers happy. Venue Next is another example. I understand some tracks are using that now and that is amazing, but we need to spread it out further. On this, it's a similar type of setup. People can give suggestions. People can say, order their food, order their drink. Importantly, order merchandise. The Florida Panthers set up this very recently and they took suggestions of people for something simple like tribute bands, merchandise people want to buy certain food and drink they want to sell. In one year, their attendance increased by 33%. That's a huge jump in one year, and they reckon in the next five years, it's going to triple again. This is something we need to notch onto. This is something that we are falling behind them. If we can combine this and in relation with the human capital, get the right people in who can harvest this information, set up a shared system, harvest this information, take it on board, analyze it, track it, in turn, we can hopefully set up some sort of an organisation which relates back to it all. And hopefully, in, we can be in the top 10 sports within 10 years. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Tim Dunworth and with me is uh, Jessica Berry and Todd Pollard. And we're going to be talking about the internal business perspective. Um, when we look at the internal perspective, it goes without saying that you have to mention there's a lack of unity in horse racing in America. This is largely down to the fact that there's an absence of a governing body. When we look at the other major racing jurisdictions and countries around the world, there's a clear sense of governance and the rules of racing. Unfortunately, that's not, that, not yet present in America. When we look at America as a country, it can be seen as a great sporting nation. Games like basketball and American football are hugely popular. They have huge attendances, huge merchandise sales, but yet these, set, these sports do not possess legalized gambling. They do, however, are, have the benefit of being run by private organizations focused on their financial benefit and popularity. Racing, unfortunately, is much more complex. Many people believe that horse racing, until the racetracks, are forced to use the same rules instead of being recommended to use the same rules, there's going to be problems with perception and fairness. Going forward, hopefully one day through carefully crafted legislation, America will be governed just like the other countries, 
But until then, we need to look forward to other bodies through marketing and media coverage to try and keep the sports perception positive and keep it promoted. When we look at marketing in America, there's already good bodies in place like the NTRA and America's Best Racing. They do things such as work with legislation, health and safety, and promote the cool things going on in the sport. This showcases that we have a good product, we just need it to reach a further audience. When we look at media, however, I think we hit a stumbling block. Our own racing channel struggles on weekends with races not going off on time, constant split screens. How are people meant to engage with the sport when we see huge graded stakes clashing with a maiden and they're going off at the same time on small screens? It's frustrating for us involved, but people external, how are they meant to engage and know what's, what's what? Um, this is largely as a result of racetracks being seen more as competitors as uni instead of unified advocates for our sport. When we come back to the racetracks, I feel like media rights is another issue. Why not give out media coverage for free to the major sporting channels on weekends? This would meet, reach a much broader aspect of people. And if competition for the spotlight is too intense, why not try and incorporate it with other sports? For example, American football, large intervals, half an hour half times. The biggest horse race of the week only takes a couple of minutes to play. Why not incorporate this into that time, reaching a much wider audience, and also an audience that are already passionate sports people, not just people interested in gambling. I think this would be a positive initiative for the sport. And with that, I'm going to pass you forward to Todd Pollard, who's going to talk a little bit more about the internal business perspective. Thanks a lot there, Tim. So hi everyone, my name's Todd, and I'm going to be talking about how we need to start embracing social media and how we can use it to change the negative perceptions on our sport. So I think everyone in this room can agree that 10 years ago, no one knew what a tweet was or how dominating Facebook would be in our lives today. However, unfortunately, it's become that way, and I think in 10 years' time, I can't predict the future, but it's still going to be so, even more so probably. Now, when I say embracing social media, I don't mean simply signing up to Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. We need to use social media with different avenues and ways to target a larger audience. So for the first one, Twitter. The Melbourne Cup's Australia's biggest race, and unfortunately, in the last 10 years, viewership's decreased by 39%. The Melbourne Racing Club's come together, and they've realised that they need to do something else to reach a larger audience and get the race out there. They've done this by collaborating with Twitter. In 2016, it was the first time that the Melbourne Cup's been shown live on Twitter for free. It was deemed hugely successful, and I for one was one that was able to tune into the race live while being on the other side of the world while we're in a new market. Another avenue is Netflix. In today's day and age, unfortunately, people just don't have the time to sit down and watch their TVs like they used to. The news used to be a daily ritual between 6 and 7, but nowadays most people seem to miss that as well. Now Netflix is a great avenue because people can pick it up at any time, anywhere. And another great thing about it is it's outside the industry. It's not focused on just horse people. It's every single person in the world that is on Netflix. There's so many great personalities in this industry. The people, the trainers, the jockeys, and the horses themselves. There's so many stories that we could portray and get out there into the public and for everybody to see how great the industry is. Again, everybody sitting in this room can probably agree that there's not a good website which is a one-stop shop for American horse racing. This simply needs to be changed and upgraded. There's so many racing jurisdictions around the world that have great examples, such as France Gallo. You can go there and get the racing inf information such as the fields, results, replays and the news stories. This is really customer focused and consumer friendly and makes it so much easier. It's hard to understand why America make it so hard to access information when it's only for the betterment of the sport. Another example is down to Australia, racing.com. It's a consumer friendly and focused initiative for, uh, for Victorian racing. It's connected to an app where you can stream and watch live racing in Victoria anytime, anywhere. And best of all, it's free. That's probably something that would be unheard of in American racing. Moving on to my next point about public perception. Dan mentioned it earlier about the article in the TDN two weeks ago that was titled, How Horse Racing Must Change. 
It was written by a Flying Star graduate and marketing manager for Airfield, Vicky Leonard. Now I think everybody sees the Australian racing industry and thinks, geez, they're doing so well down there. Bloodstock prices are surging and the prize money is increasing as well. It's just a fun industry that everybody wants to be a part of at the moment. However, through her research through a social media uh, analytics agency, the results were pretty damning. 48% of content on social media during their busiest racing period, the Melbourne Cup Spring Carnival last year, was unfavourable in tone towards horse racing. On top of this, there was 248,000 mentions of horse racing that went hand in hand with animal cruelty. Unfortunately, social media is a big downfall for us. These animal rights activists, they can convey these fabricated ideas and paint them into stories that gain a large cult following on Facebook and other social media uh, avenues. We're doing so much for making racing better in this country. The thoroughbred aftercare alliance are huge for rehoming and retraining racehorses. The medications and doping and all that's getting cleaned up through scientific uh, based research by companies such as the Coalition for Horse Racing Integrity and the um, Racing Medication and Testing Consortium. This is huge and we're definitely not going backwards as an industry here. This is also shown by the breakdown race rate decreasing by 23% since the Jockey Club started researching the information in 2009. <coughs> These are the sort of things that need to be conveyed to the public, but it's so hard when we're always defending ourselves. Now it's probably not about converting these animal rights activists into coming and keen in while the meat's on and watching our product and betting on our product. It's more these people that have no opinion. They don't like horse racing, but they don't hate it. These are the types of people that we need to bring together and show them how great our racing industry is and convert them into supporters of the racing industry. Thanks a lot for listening. I'll now pass you over to Jessica. Thanks, Todd. So Todd addressed the issue of horse welfare and how it's perceived by those outside our sport, and I'm here to talk a bit about the welfare of racing staff. American horse racing has a huge reliance on a large immigrant workforce, and that workforce is primarily Hispanic. Unfortunately, that leaves us very vulnerable to staff shortages as a result of government immigration policy. An example of this occurred last fall when the workman's exemption clause of the H-2B visa expired which means that the H-2B visa, commonly used uh, by backstretch workers as, it, um, as backstretch workers are categorized as non-farm animal caretakers, the H-2B visa would allow for those people to go home to their families and then return to the United States to keep their jobs. But with the expiration of that clause, now if those people choose to return to their home countries, they have to once again file for a brand new visa, put their application in, and compete again in a pool of other applicants for a limited number of visas available. This puts our employers in a precarious position because it often forces them to hire undocumented immigrants in order to remain operational. Well, there isn't a whole lot that we can do as an industry besides lobbying to affect what goes on in Washington. But what we can do is ask ourselves, why do we rely so heavily on an immigrant workforce? The answer is that most of our jobs have such demanding hours and working conditions that they don't provide the kind of work-life balance that Americans prioritize particularly young Americans. In a poll done by uh, CBS quite recently, um, they polled working Americans as to what were the biggest contributing factors in their overall job satisfaction. And a lot of you might think that the number one factor would be salary, which is what I thought when I looked into it. But as it turns out, only 25% of respondents marked that salary was the most important thing to their satisfaction with their job where 52% of respondents indicated that the people that they work with was the most important factor in their job satisfaction. Other high-ranking factors included feeling appreciated and flexible working hours. There are already organizations out there, such as um, the uh, Racetrack Chaplaincy, the Backside Learning Center, and uh, programs like the Goodolphin Stud and Stable Staff Awards that are doing a huge amount uh, to promote this positive environment and to recognize these people for their achievements and to create a healthier backstretch lifestyle. However, there's a lot more that we can be doing. We recently participated, the 12 of us, in an innovations workshop put on by our director, Clota Cavanaugh, and we were challenged to come up with solutions to the staff shortage problem. And one of the solutions that emerged was the idea of a swing staff organization. If racetracks were to take the initiative to create organizations on their backstretches where individuals can go 
become registered as competent, put their information down, and then commit to days of the week when they can come and rotate in barns. It would allow for employers to give every and any member of their staff a day off as long as they can rely on a prearranged, competent person to come and fill in. So a solution like this helps the employees because it gives them a better work-life balance. It helps the employers because it gives them more staff to choose from. And then it also helps anyone who might be involved or interested in becoming involved in our industry. Like a young person, maybe a little bit like myself. When I went to university in San Diego, I would have loved to have committed a morning or two out of my week to going and working at Del Mar. But unfortunately, part-time jobs in this industry are hard to find and it's hard to find a way into a trainer's barn if you come from an outside perspective. So creating avenues for young people to get involved that aren't a seven day a week, seven day a week commitment should be a priority of racetracks around America. Our vision for 2027 is to have the backstretch be a sustainable place to work. Moving on to regulation. We have to accept that there's a real possibility that we won't have a national unified governing body in 10 years time. And therefore we cannot rely on one um, and hope that it will solve our problems that we're facing currently. So what we can do is innovate. So let's take a current problem in racing, licensing. <laughs> Any given horseman or owner in America, I'm sure, has had to deal with the hassle of getting licensed in different jurisdictions where they wanna run horses. And there's different requirements for every jurisdiction. Uh, there's different licensing applications to fill out. They all expire at different times. I'm sure a few of you are familiar with the crisis of entering a horse in a jurisdiction that isn't the one you live in and then come to find out that your license may expire, I don't know, three days before. And so the solution to this problem is we need to create a national licensing database. And because the majority of people in 2017 have smartphones, and I'm sure most if not all people in 2027 will, that database needs to be accessible through your phone. And that database could take the form of an app. And that app could look something like this. So imagine that you log on to this app and there's your profile. And you have all of your information that you've already inputted one time. And your smartphones in your pockets right now have the capability to access your bank accounts and your credit card information to pay. They have the capability to accept your signature, they have facial recognition software, and they can do anything and everything that you would need to fill out a license. Whereas right now, most of the time, well, we end up struggling with a fax machine, we end up making a trip to the uh, licensing office to actually get it done, and it wastes time, money, and paper. If you go onto this app, you can register all the horses that you're connected with, it can track their entries, it can keep track of your licenses. It can send you notifications when those licenses expire, especially if you have an upcoming entry. And you can find any application that you may need. So what we're hoping for is that the next time that, say, I might need to renew my license, to log on to the app, find the renewal application. It'll autofill all of my information. I can pay. I can even. take my own photo, and then I can submit this to be sent off to the licensing office, and within a few minutes, hopefully, if I get verified, I'll have an e-license that I can present to an employer or any racing authority. So our goal is that by 2027, if we create an online database, a minimum threshold of 75% of, uh, of licensees in the United States will be using this method. So, just to recap on a few things that my team touched on, we really, want to, we really would like to emphasize the importance of national marketing strategies and the different channels that we can pursue those in. We want to remind you guys that horse welfare is a huge issue in public perception and we need to promote all the things that we're doing right. Staff, well, staff welfare should be at the forefront of all employers' minds moving forward into the future. And finally, if we use technology appropriately, we can address current regulation issues that the divides between jurisdictions don't allow us to. So with that, I'll hand you off to our customer perspective, Luke Morgan. Okay, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Luke Morgan, and I'll begin the discussion from the customer's perspective. 
So the customer perspective looks at exactly what we're offering, how we're offering it, and exactly what we can do to add value to the current product, making it a little bit more appealing for those attendees. So I'll begin with on-track experience. Chris will begin with promoting racing's participants, and Ami will uh, talk about delivering innovative media solutions. So beginning with on-track experience. At the moment, our big race days are hugely successful. Kentucky Oaks attracted over 100,000 people. The Kentucky Derby attracted over 150,000 people. But then we look at stark contrast. An evening's racing at Churchill Downs can struggle to attract 5,000 people. But let's not all be doom and gloom. The big race days can attract the numbers. So it's maximizing the experience at those days and hopefully building on those smaller days. At the big weekends racing, the Kentucky Derbies, the attendance is a lot more younger demographics than you might initially think. The most popular age group um, is the 21 to 29 year olds, and they account for 22% um, of attendees. The subsequent three um, groups, um, the 30 to 45 year olds, account for an additional 35% of total attendees. So this is great. These are the millennials and their younger family, family groups. So it's maximizing exactly what they want and tailoring our product to their needs. One such thing that came up in our interviews was smoking. Smoking is banned at all other events, so why is racing any different? Potentially we could um, incorporate more, smaller um, smoking areas um, and allowing the rest of it to be non-smoking. Another thing we need to think about is daycare. The majority of those age groups, as I said, were more likely to be family groups with children with them. So providing something that appeals to both the parents and the children, having good activities within those daycare centres that provides or make the children a lot happier and thus encourage their parents to drag them along in the future. Of the interviews that we um, conducted, one really stood out for me. It's from an 18 year old who said, for a child who isn't allowed to bet and is typically dragged along uh, to the racetrack by its parents, it's not a great experience. This really stood out for me. We had the opportunity, we had an attendee, and we potentially lost them with a lack of engaging them um, so then it has a roll-on effect, and they're not the only ones that have had similar experiences. So how do we look to encourage them and giving them a better experience? One such thing is using exactly what we've already got. A simple thing is equisizers. They're used widely amongst all jockeys in regaining fitness and in training uh, to become jockeys. It's a unique thing that we can give uh, to the children and teenagers, something different, something that leaves a mark in their mind and makes them want to return both in the short term future and long term future, and hopefully build on their tendencies. Another problem that um, we found from our interviewees was the lack of information available. If you choose to come racing in America, and you choose then to go in the gates, if you want to gain further information, you typically have to spend an extra $5 on a race program. And even if you do go ahead, as many people choose not to do and buy a program, you end up with a product that's really difficult to understand. Only the more engaged race goers can uh, understand it. Even my, myself, coming to America the first time back in January, struggled to grasp it. So it's providing a product that's a little more accessible. Take a more European style to it with the program. Programs we offer are visually attractive and physically appealing. So a simple thing is having the horse's silks on the page so they can easily identify with each horse. A comment under each, uh, each horse, uh, rating their chances with the final verdict helping the um, race goers to pick a horse and simplifying the betting process for them and hopefully encouraging them to place a bet. This is used widely at the moment at Del Mar, which is a huge success. It's given out for free, it pays for itself uh, through the in uh, program advertising. Building on this idea of increasing engagement uh, through betting is the idea of um, um, our, sorry, our um, race day ambassadors. So race day ambassadors are used wisely at the widely at the moment across some of America's tracks. One such is Gulfstream Park. But in Gulfstream Park, you have to actively seek it out to go and get it, something that not every race scorer is willing to do. At the moment at Cleveland, we've even got pathologists, and they're great at helping you place your bet and making it a little less complicated. But we want to build on this, provide something that's a little bit more engaging. So people that are, by hiring people that are easily um, accessible to, people are easily relatable to, they'll help explain, be it the race card, be it things to look out for in the paddock, things to look out for as the horse goes to post, 
and hopefully then in turn they'll put bets on and hopefully increase handle. Another thing is our biggest asset at the moment is the horses. It's what we all love and have got us into the industry and kept us in so far. So we want to give our attendees the opportunity to have such experiences. So the main thing, one thing that came out for me from the, in the aftermath of uh, the Belmont uh, Stakes weekend, despite the high profile races, was the video that emerged online of one clearly unhappy race goer who had spent quite some time to get front row uh, access to the paddock so he could experience these great horses before they headed out to the track, only for the, tra the horses to bypass the paddock going directly to the track. This had two implications. First of all, it's negative media access for an industry that we can't afford to be losing. Another problem is those that actually did show up, it's a negative experience for them, a little less enjoyable, maybe questioning whether they want to return in the future. Another thing is, at the moment in America, in an attempt to increase handle, we've got these large race gaps between races. So it's maximizing on this, be it using that opportunity to take in retired racehorse, only recently retired, it was announced that Ben's cat was retired. This is a horse that it, it stirs something in people's emotions. It's a great horse. He was campaigned heavily, up to it being 11 year old. So it's maximizing on this, a horse that people love, bringing it out, parading him, giving him the opportunity to see that there is life after the track. Another thing is the backside tours. They're done by like, Gulfstream at the park at the moment and they're hugely successful giving the race goers a chance to go around to the backside to see where the horses are, maybe change perceptions on welfare, and seeing overall how they're looked after and cared for. Something I personally enjoyed, and I know it could be used widely on the big race days. So I'll now hand you over to Chris. Oops, there we go. Thanks very much, Luke. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Farrell, and for a customer perspective, I'm going to talk about creating icons to attract more fans to the sport. So if we look at sport around the world, we can see that they all have two common things. They have athletes and they have fans. But that fan size varies greatly. So for example now, if I ask the audience here if they could please raise their hand if they would consider themselves an active fan of men's professional swimming. <laughs> okay, as you look around, you don't see too many hands going up. But yet, if I point you up here to the screen, to the guy that's at the bottom left fighting his gold medal, I'm sure you all know who he is, Michael Phelps. What's even more impressive is that his big performances only occur every four years at the Olympics. Likewise, with mixed martial arts, I'm sure those of you on social media have had it full with Conor McGregor in the last few weeks, and his fight isn't until next month. So what's different about horse racing? Why can't we do that? Well, if I asked a member of the general public to name a horse in the past three years, I'm pretty confident that they're going to say American Pharaoh. Now, American Pharaoh is a superstar. He won the Triple Crown after 37 years of no horse ever doing it. So, I mean, the media response he got, it was phenomenal. And that's what these guys had. They had the media there to do it, positive media engagement. And that's what horse racing is missing. We need more of that positive media in on media outlets, different types, social media, TV, whatever it is. We need more stories to build relationships here with the fans, get them interested in. If we look at NBC with Ryan Ascot a couple of weeks ago, they did a fantastic job. They showed the trainers, the owners, they showed even the grooms there getting interviewed as well. They talked about fashion, food, they had celebrities there. They really catered for everyone. I think we need more things like that to get people interested in it. Another thing that the guys mentioned on was the betting, that it might come across a bit difficult for new people to come into it. A recent study that we found on millennials was that they're less likely to gamble than non-millennials, but if skill was involved, they'd be more likely to do it. Now, handicapping, I'm not a big, you know, I'm not very good at, but it's a very skillful trait from what I hear and what I can see. But again, these guys aren't going to be able to do it unless they go to the track and unless they watch racing on TV. So it's coming back to the start. We need to build these relationships, get them watching TV so they can, you know, get their icons up there. So if you like, look up there now with Bob Baffert and Arrogate, if we get these sort of icons on, me on media so they can relate to them, whether it be on TV, social media, Twitter, whatever it is, get them involved so people can start following them. And likewise then, to get some merchandise. So like if that fan was American Pharaoh, or he was a fan of American <coughs> Pharaoh, but then he's gone after a couple of years, who does he support then? So there's that lack of knowing who to support, but say he went off and he decided to support the owners, Team Zayat. He could be going around the races with his scarf on, those blue and yellow dots, and he could be a supporter for Team Zayat. Same like you could have your friends there. They could say, well, I'm Team Bob Baffert, you're Team Todd Fletcher. 
get everyone involved, a bit of rivalry, that's what it lacks there at the minute. Make it like other sports. If I go to a UK game, I'm going to wear blue, like I am now. But the, but the rest of the guys at racing, we don't really do that. So I think having something like that there will definitely help people attract to the sport. So going back to it, get the relationship there between the fans and the icons. So if you just picture this, a fan going to a music concert, they're going to see their favourite singer. Imagine the same for the racetrack. They're after watching this racing, like Royal Ascot, and they're after saying, oh yeah, I'm a fan of that guy. And then they're going to go to the races and see this person there, that's going to increase attendance. And then once they're at the track, they can then say, well, how do I get more involved? Well, if you're at a music concert, you're going to buy a CD. So why not say, well, put a bet on your horse. Then you can really build that relationship and really feel part of the team. And I think that goes way past the monetary value of the bet. I think if we do this, we'll have a loyal fan base and we'll definitely increase the attendance, media and the handle for this sport. So now I'd like to hand you over to Amy Carlson. And increasing attendance and improving the race day experience is of course important, very important. But we can't stop there. Because it's difficult for most sport fans to attend more than a handful of events per year. But today, the, uh, for horse racing fans, the alternative viewing choices are basically limited to just one, TV. But TV lacks the energy of a live event, and to be fair, most young people today have moved away from TV. They will watch sport videos on YouTube and Facebook and Snapchat instead. So what we need to do in order to grow our fan base is to offer alternative choices, alternative viewing choices for people to watch the races. But before we do that, we must start with promoting our main events. We must start with helping our customers and our potential customers to understand what races are important and why. On an average Saturday, there can be racing on 40 different tracks in North America, but only a handful of these races are going to be of interest for the average sport fan. So let's pick a limited number of races, let's say 60, and promote these as our premier sporting events. And when we've done that, let us deliver these races in a way that's interesting and really cool to watch. In a few years, it's going to be normal to watch sports using virtual reality. And that's made possible thanks to 360 degree videos or cameras that are placed in the sports arena or on the pitch, or, or in our case, on the track. And uh, ideally, the viewer has the, or the fan has the virtual reality glasses, and they can look left, and they can look right, and they can switch between different cameras, and they can really feel a part of the crowd, and really become a part of the action. Some sports leagues have already embraced this. The uh, NBA showed their first virtual reality game in uh, 2015, and this is how that looked. This is just a few 360 degrees cameras that are placed in a few different places around the arena, and this is what one fan saw. But imagine we do this on a race course, so we can have a camera inside the paddock, and we can have one in the stand, we can have one, well, a few on the track, we can have one in the starting stalls, and in fact, we can even have them, place them on the jockeys. Have a look at uh, this race from uh, Woodbine last year. Thanks for lying down, they're locked up. And they're up. So the jockey has the 360 degree camera on her cap, on the riding cap, and you know, imagine you're viewing this with, with the virtual reality glasses, so you can, you can look around, you can, you can see what the jockey is doing, you can see more than what the jockey is doing, because you can, you can see where you are, you can look to the left, you can look to the right, you can look at the horses behind you. our premier sports events and when we have delivered them in the coolest way possible let's make sure that our fans share this that they share these experiences because 
Young people today don't just want to participate in a sports event or watch a sports event. They want to share it as well. And Facebook, Twitter and all other social media platforms have kind of changed the sports media landscape. Like now it's the user that's the creator. And user generated content has become a really important marketing trend. We can get our fans to be our ambassadors on social media. We can get our fans to market horse racing for us. But we can't just sit back and passively watch them do it. What we have to do is provide good quality content. We have to provide these virtual reality streams. We have to provide good photos and replays for fans to watch and to edit and to share. And we can also encourage fans that when they're at the track to take photos and, and film the race and share that with their friends in the wider community because that is how we build a fan base. So what Luke, Chris and I mean is that the customer keeps changing and we have to change with it. So we must start at the track, we must improve the race course experience so that people want to come back and they want to bring their friends because that's how we increase attendance. And we also, building on that, we need to promote our stars. We need to you know, promote our top trainers, our top jockeys, owners, and of course the horses on social media and build a fan base so people want to go to the tracks and, and follow them. Then let's promote our premier sporting events and let's uh, encourage social sharing. And with an eye to the future, let us look at the technology trend, let us embrace innovative technology. And I think if the tracks, if the marketing organizations, if the participants get together and do this, we can grow our sport and we can make sure that horse racing becomes one of the top 10 sports in America again. And with these words, I'll hand over to our final team, which is the financial perspective with Jack, Meg and Michael. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ami. I'm Jack, and along with Meg and Michael, we're going to present the financial perspective. So these groups have looked into some really good ideas to increase attendance and better the customer experience. But when strategists and stakeholders look into their industry, look into their business, one thing often sticks out, and that's the ability to make a profit. If we can't make money, we're not going to go anywhere. So we're going to talk about the financial perspective, and me personally, I'm going to talk about wagering revenue generation and revenue distribution. So when racing was established, it had a gambling monopoly. You could, the only place you could place a bet in America was at the racetrack. So people went in droves, grandstands were packed, and it was great for the sport. But this just wasn't gonna stay that way. Gambling, <clears throat> gambling regulation loosened, and entertainment competition grew, and naturally, racing's market share shrunk. And then, as this has happened, there's only been one major evolution in wagering, and that's um, simulcasting. And so tracks can sell their signal, and with that signal, other places, off-track facilities, whether it's brick and mortar, or online ADWs can take bets. So this is great initially, a lot of extra money comes in, you generate more revenue, which is really good. Where we might have messed up is the distribution model. So when you go to the racetrack and place a bet, approximately 15% of that money goes back to the major investors. Owners get money through purses, the racetrack gets money. They have high operational costs, and it's expensive to own a horse, it's expensive to race a horse, so that's how it should be. They should be getting rewarded on those dollars gamble on their product. But when you place a bet off track, whether it's at a brick and mortar facility or through an online platform, it's closer to about 5% that goes back to the major investors, whether that be the owners or the racetrack. And this is a broken re revenue distribution model. When, when Apple sells an iPhone at Walmart, Walmart's not making head. Are they making money? Sure. But it's Apple that makes the money. They invest. They're the one who gets the money back. That's how it should be in racing. No matter where the bet's placed, the people putting the product on should be rewarded. So tracks, we think, should look at these simulcasting contracts. And it doesn't have to be a lot of money. There's billions of dollars wagered on horse racing every year. Just small incremental changes in percentages can be tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars back to owners putting on the best product. So if you're Keeneland, you're Saratoga, you're Del Mar, and you have a product that people think is more quality than the other, has higher handle, you get rewarded more. And that's how it should be. That, that's just the logical way it should be done. When it comes to uh, 
wagering and expanded wagering, it's something the industry has to keep their eyes open to and accept it a bit. When there's things directly tied to racing, whether it's historical racing machines or ideas like Equilottery or easier wagers, we have to be open to this. It may not be the traditional bet where you go to the window and put $2 to win on the horse you like, but the more revenue we can generate for the industry, the healthier it's going to be and we're just going to be better off overall. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand you over off to Meg and she's going to talk a bit about cost and efficiencies. Hi everyone, so my name is Meg Hebert and I'm from England and as Jack said, I'm going to be talking about some potential cost efficiencies the industry could be making. So for the American thoroughbred industry to achieve its objective of becoming a top 10 sport by 2027, there needs to be a conscientious cost efficiencies drive throughout the sport to promote financial viability and increase returns on investment for thoroughbred owners. This can be achieved by making wagering more valuable to the sport as an incentive for ownership. Currently, the 38 racing jurisdictions across the United States perform administration tasks such as license issuance, post-race sample testing, supplying stewards, and funding research projects concurrently. These services are paid for by a proportion of the takeout from wagering. It will instead here be argued that the creation of one national body for the administration, not governance of racing, would be both more efficient and cost effective because it would require only one premises, one set of staff, one software system, and one set of insurance policies, for example. Such centralization maximizes economies of scale through controlled quantity production from one geographical location. The decreased cost of administering the sport would therefore allow each state to redistribute the newly surplus fund, funds toward purses. The nationwide increase in purses is anticipated to incentivize the ownership of resources as the potential return on individual investments are increased by the enhanced earning potential of each thoroughbred in training. To exemplify these current financial inefficiencies caused by the takeout structure, we will look at California as an example. So the California Horse Racing Board, the CRHB, is the administrative body for racing in the state. In 2015, $2.983 billion was wagered on Californian racing. Of this, $137 million was put towards purses, while a staggering $620 million was lost to the industry as takeout at a blended takeout rate of 20.82%. While some of these leakages supported essential projects such as track commissions and workers' compensation funds, a total of $12.6 million was used to support the CRHP. Therefore, approximately 0.42% of all takeout money is being used for administration purposes. A misappropriation of money, which could be um, substantially reduced to 0.2% if all racing states would pool this money to fund a national body to perform the administrative tasks of all states with legalized parimutuel wagering. This proposal, as I said, would exist as a stimulus to racehorse ownership. With our Californian example, this would have put an additional $6.3 million worth towards purses in 2015. It is therefore our contention that it is essential to the financial welfare and stability of the sport for wagering funds to be used as efficiently as possible. The reduction in takeout rate dedicated to supporting state administration bodies offers a major streamlining and cost inefficiencies elimination policy that would also provide an initial opportunity for national cooperation. This policy therefore fulfills the industry's tenure objective by increasing the utility of handle as a source of investment for the industry with a, result, with a resulting growth in, purpose, in purses and ownership incentives. Thank you very much and I'll hand over to our last speaker, Michael, who's going to talk about ways to increase foreign investment to the American thoroughbred industry. Thank you, Mick. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Michael from China. So now I'm going to talk about increased income. So the idea of increasing income is to bring the foreign capitals into American racing industry. So who are we going to target on? Rich people, <laughs> apparently. So which, where, where, where are those rich people? How are we going to target on them? 
we, we cannot just target on all of them around the world. We need a specific group of people. So where are they? Let's have a look at the statistic in 2016. In 2016, there are 535 billionaires in America. At the same time, there are 568 billionaires in mainland China. They are rich, they are looking for investment opportunities, and they are who we are going to target on. So now we know who we are going to target, and the next question is how? Social media. Social media is the most effective way for promotion. In general, when we talk about social media, people usually think like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Snapchat. However, the situation in China is quite different. While those social media is popular all around the world, they are not widely being used in mainland China. Instead, there is another app called WeChat. Why I mention WeChat to you? Because when Facebook has 1.9 billion active users in the world, WeChat already got 1 billion users. It has large population. It's an app for you to chat, for sharing news, post articles, even you can purchase online on it. So this, this is the great platform for us to promote our industry. Maybe right now, some of you guys may think, mm, I'm American, I'm Westerner. It's, it's reasonable that I don't know the Asian things. Are you sure? <laughs> Let's have a look. So right now, some international thoroughbred organizations already got their WeChat account, such as Magic Medium, Ireland th Irish Thoroughbred Marketing, uh, Australia uh, English, and Australia Turf Club, New Zealand Mar uh, Thoroughbred Marketing. They all got their official WeChat account. They post the news, they promote their business, they do all the things on, the, on, the, on WeChat. Some people may doubt, does it really work? We will see. So if you randomly pick an article from those accounts, you will find the article can be shared or viewed by more than 700 times. And since 2012, the Rider Horse Club from Inner Mongolia has purchased 644 thoroughbreds from New Zealand and Australia. Early this year, China, uh, 76 thoroughbreds has been shipped from Ireland to China. And five months later, 81 thoroughbreds has been shipped from Australia to China. As you can see the number and the outcome, you will know how, how those official accounts contribute for those successful results. So now we know that. What are we going to do? We, as my peer already mentioned, that we need a marketing team. Indeed, we need a marketing team. We need a group of them dedicated to work on, work on WeChat account, advertising American racing, advertise American racing WeChat account into the target racing communities in China and promote and post the information about American, American racing, post the top leader, top jockey, top trainer, and the sales information, big racing day. And what we want to, what, what we want, finally we want to bring them to American racing, give them opportunity to involve American racing, invest, invest in American racing, and increasing the financial situation in American racing, and ultimately make the American racing awesome again. <laughs> Thank you very much, and now I hand it back to our team leaders. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank all of you for being here this evening. Our four perspective teams have presented a lot of ideas here tonight. The learning and growth perspective talked a bit about uh, how it's important to invest in human capital in terms of who we recruit, and how it's important to harness information capital. And the internal business perspective looked at a national marketing strategy, avenues for that, the importance of welfare, and how we can use technology and innovation uh, in, the face of, uh, in the face of division in order to improve our regulatory processes. Our customer perspective looked at some really exciting race day experience ideas, 
including uh, the creation of icons for fans to find and follow throughout their careers, as well as rivalries, and of course, the really exciting possibility of virtual reality viewership moving forward. And our financial team uh, showed us how the simulcasting contracts need to be restructured, how we can reduce cost inefficiencies, and uh, how we can attract more investment, particularly from China, um, with the use of social media. So, Ami, would you like to uh, finish us off here? I would love to. Um, as Lewis Carroll wrote, you must run as fast as you can just to stay in one place. If you wish to go further, you have to run twice as fast as that. The reality is that horse racing cannot rely on its glorious past when facing competition for sport fans' attention and alternative gambling methods. We must uh, constantly strive to develop a better product and to meet the 21st century customer needs. The plan and the goals that we have suggested are ambitious and they require commitment and cooperation from various industry bodies and organizations. But collaboration is necessary to achieve a sustainable future for the sport. Without innovating, without embracing technology, and without using existing resources more efficiently, horse racing will be left behind other industries and other sports that are driving forward. But together, we can change that, and I think we can all come together and make sure that we make horse racing in America one of the top 10 sports again. So thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you for being here tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed our talk. And uh, with these words, I will hand over, well, we will have a question and answer session. So I will welcome my fellow trainees back up here. And I'll hand the word back over to Kate.